Um, my name is Maria. I work for Edinburgh City Mission and I am going to be um, leading the conversation a little bit with our amazing guest today, who is Dr. Krish Kandaya. Um, you might know him and uh, I'll ask him to introduce himself in a minute, but um, I also wanted to give you a bit of context of a place at the table if this is the first time you're joining us. Um, this is a conversation that we started a, a couple of months after George Floyd was murdered in the US. Um, and we wanted to respond as an organization in a meaningful way mm. to us. And uh, to us, that meant just starting by listening and learning. And we've been taking our time um, for that. So it's been over a year that we've been having these conversations and listening and learning from people from different ethnic backgrounds and social backgrounds. And, and um, for what, you, what we expect to the next year is take this uh, listening and learning step forward. We've listened, we've been learning, and now we're starting to ask ourselves what's next. Um, and it's a question that actually some of you have asked our other guests, like, what do we do with this that we, we're hearing? What can we do for you? What can we do as a church? Um, so I don't think there's a better guest for this transition than uh, Dr. Krish Kandaya, just to help us process a little bit. Um, but we are going to ask him just the same questions that we ask all the guests. Um, and then we'll see, we'll see what other surprises uh, we encounter as we, as we chat. As always, there go there's going to be some time for questions at the end. Um, and also, uh, this is something we've not, well, I, I just gonna take some time for this as well because uh, we have Reverend Andy Longwe who was one of our guests and is going to be hosting a place at the table next year. Um, so I'm just gonna ask him to introduce himself briefly and then we'll start with um, the interview with uh, Dr. Krish. So Andy, over to you. Thanks, Maria. Yep. So just very briefly, um, for those of you who weren't there when I, I spoke, I'm Andy, I'm the minister presently of Cumbernauld Free Church, which is northeast of Glasgow, married to Marina. And we have uh, two children, Theo, who's two, and Ellie, who's just six weeks old. So just adjusting to life uh, in, in, uh, as, as a dad of two. Um, and I, I'm, uh, I've just accepted the call to, to become the minister of uh, London City Presbyterian Church, so moving there. But I have a real heart for Edinburgh City Mission, spent, spent five years in uh, Edinburgh as a student and uh, just love the, the mission that we've been entrusted by our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Uh, and a passionate heart for the, the, the diversity of the church, the gospel to reach the nations and us to be one in Christ. And uh, both with ethnicities and diversity in class. And so I'm really looking forward to, to just being part of these conversations. I've uh, loved participating in, in it myself. And so thank you so much for the opportunity just to introduce myself. And I'm really sad that Maria is going and that's hence the reason why I'm taking over, but um, it's, it's great to be part of this. Thank you, Andy. Um, okay, so uh, why don't we start now with the questions for Dr. Krish Kandaya? So uh, the first one, and this is a very open question, so feel free to just tell us as much or <laughs> as little as you want. Um, but to, if you could share some of your story with us, your journey. Um, oh, well, wow. that, that <laughs> is a very open question. So um, feel free to jump in if, if I get boring or irrelevant. Uh, that, that, that'll be fine. And it's lovely to meet everybody. Uh, sorry, we're not face to face. Um, I had a proverbial um, or apocryphal, I didn't know they were real, um, deep fried Mars bar when I was in Glasgow. Uh, so I'm kind of missing, missing my Scottish uh, food intake. So I'm, I'm always up for another visit, although I, I, I can't have them too often. My calorific intake will be too high. Uh, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, my name is Krish. Um, it's short for Krishna. I come from a Hindu, Catholic, Sri Lankan, Malaysian, Indian, Irish family. And I was born in the UK. Um, I was raised in a loving home uh, with my mum, my dad and my sister. Uh, my dad is a Hindu. My mum uh, kind of was a, Catholic, a nominal Catholic, but came to 
a kind of a living faith later in her life. Um, my sister uh, is um, currently working for Arosha. Uh, she's passionate about the environment. And um, my wife, I, and our six children, um, well, most of the time we all live together when they're not studying uh, in a house just in Oxfordshire. And my sister lives upstairs. So we're kind of doing this kind of multi-family living thing, which is new to us, but uh, it's been quite fun. Uh, I uh, used to work for UCCF back in the day. That was my first job out of university, uh, really focused on um, helping university students explore the Christian faith by engaging with the Bible, particularly the Gospels. I was also interested in equipping university students to think about their whole life as mission and how your time at university can equip you for service within economics or law or engineering um, rather than just thinking about the time as as evangelism training I wanted to see students really think long term about the impact they could have uh, for God in their field of study or work uh, after working uh, for UCCF I then uh, my wife and I led a team in Albania where we um, helped to start um, formally the Albanian student movement uh, that was is, is currently still going, which is really encouraging, run by Albanians for Albanians. And we tried to have that same kind of whole life um, mission there, particularly with medical students and law students. That was where we saw the kind of most traction for that way of thinking. Uh, after that, I came back to the UK quite disillusioned by how um, disconnected the church is are from one another. Uh, Albania was held up as a model of missionary cooperation, uh, but sadly I found it very splintered and divided um, and it made me go back to university and I studied missiology, uh, particularly the missiology of Leslie Newbegin while I was pastoring a multicultural church in Harrow. Um, I went on to do a PhD in that area and then uh, for a while served uh, on the faculty at Wycliffe Hall. Uh, looking at evangelism, mission and apologetics were my areas. Um, and then I worked for the Evangelical Alliance, spearheading some of their programs on biblical literacy, um, holistic mission. And the final stage of my work there was uh, looking at um, fostering and adoption and the church really fulfilling God's call to care for widows and orphans. Um, so what does that look like practically in the 21st century? I span out a little charity called Home for Good, uh, which was trying to inspire Christians up and down the nations, uh, the four nations, all four of them, uh, to think about fostering and adoption. And that got quite a good amount of traction. And I did that job as well as being the principal uh, president of London School of Theology um, and a bit of consultancy until last December. Uh, and I now work for the government on um, a lead at the Adoption of Special Guardianship Leadership Board, um, which is informing the government on adoption policy and special guardianship and kinship care. And I'm currently running a couple of projects. So one is around Hong Kong integration. 150,000 Hong Kong is expected in the UK this year. And uh, Afghan Welcome, which is about welcoming Afghan refugees and the church's response to them. Uh, so sorry if that was a bit long-winded, but I needed to bring you a little bit up to speed. No, that was great. Thank you very much. And you you do have a lot, a lot of experience and you've done amazing things. So I think it was worth um, hearing it from you. Um, so the other question we normally ask our guests is how did they enter this culture? And understanding like uh, most of us who were interviewed don't belong to a majority culture, but I suppose you were born in the UK. My question would be in that case, how do you feel in terms of like your belonging? Um, do you feel you're part of the majority culture being born here or because of your background, perhaps like somewhere in between? Mm, that's a really good question, Maria. Um, I guess I have always felt like an outsider, even though I was born here. People assume that I wasn't born here. Um, uh, let, let me go a little back, a little bit further back. So I mentioned my my mother was born in India, and she was born into a mixed race family. Um, so a white dad, Indian mother. Uh, my white grandfather died in the Second World War, 
And because my mother was mixed race, uh, or to use the horrible phrase that was described about her, which I find offensive, but she was called half caste. Um, and that meant her, she was socially unacceptable. And so when my grandfather died in the war, um, my mother and her two sisters were put into three separate orphanages in India. And that was because they were socially unacceptable. Um, but side note, and please come back to me on this if you're interested, um, 5.1 million children in orphanages around the world right now. Almost all of them have living parents. They are not orphans. They are there because of poverty uh, or social exclusion because of disability, race or culture. Um, the church is the largest funder, supporter, visitor to orphanages around the world. We are unintentionally harming more children than we're helping through that mechanism. Uh, if you're currently supporting an orphanage, please talk to me. I can help you with that. Um, anyway, my mother comes to the UK. Uh, because a grand aunt found out about these three sisters separated from one another and their mother. She brings um, her, my mother's mother and her two sisters to the UK and they end up in Brighton. Um, my mother trains to be a nurse. Um, she faced all sorts of racist abuse as a 16 year old recent immigrant. Um, some of the patients wouldn't let my mother touch them for fear that somehow the brown would come off. Uh, she was told to go black home, which is, isn't that clever how the wordplay of racist can go, you know, um, all the jokes about, you know, why the Indians um, have, you know, red dots on their heads, it's because they should go back to where they came from. And, you know, that, that, was, that was the narrative that my mother was facing in the 50s and 60s. Um, but my mother launched a one woman resistance campaign to that xenophobia. Um, every Friday night, she'd cook up a massive vat of curry and rice and everyone who felt like they didn't fit in was welcome in my mother's house. And, you know, that that was the kind of forming narrative of my childhood, because my mother met my father that way. He was an international student from Malaysia and, you know, they, they got married and started having kids. But strangers were always welcome in our house because my mother had had that outsider experience. And for me, um, you know, it, it's it's come into kind of fusion with my Christian faith that I've discovered that hospitality is one of the defining features of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, although weirdly, it's not an often talked about element in our evangelism or our discipleship. And yet, you know, we can, we can have a long exegetical conversation about, you know, God's hospitality in the Garden of Eden, Abraham offering hospitality to God himself in his tent, you know, all the way through to Isaiah 58, you know, sharing your food with the hungry um, through to, um, you know, Jesus, the refugee to Matthew 25, where you can tell whether you're in the kingdom of God or not. This is the clearest judgment parable. Um, and it's based on how you've responded to the hungry, the thirsty, the naked and the stranger um, all the way through to, you know, the, the great wedding banquet. Uh, where God lays on the hospitality uh, to the nations. So, you know, this, this it, it came to me relatively late in my Christian life, that there's this golden thread through the Bible of God's hospitality, but there's a golden thread through my story. What is it that combines, you know, my early childhood, um, my um, fostering and adoption story as a family, fostering adoption work professionally, working with refugees and asylum seekers? Well, well that would be the hospitality uh, uh, language too so um, that's that's been part of my journey into the country and the culture but also into church culture as well um, and I'm finding that the language of hospitality has political cut through so if you say I'm, I'm passionate about immigration that is a red flag issue currently with our current government um, but if you say you're passionate about hospitality well, that's not a trigger word um, politically. Theologically, if you say that you're passionate about social justice, that is a trigger word for some sectors of the church. Um, but if you are passionate about hospitality, that is an open door because that you can't be a Christian and not passionate about hospitality because that's such a golden thread. So I'm, I'm finding some really interesting um, conversations there. And, and I both feel like a cultural outsider 
because of my mixed race background. But I also feel like a theological outsider in most Christian circles. I don't quite fit because I'm passionate about scripture, evangelism, and hospitality, and those don't always sit well together in the various streams. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I loved your answer. I think it was very clear how there isn't a clear answer sometimes for these questions, and that's true for so many people in this country. Um, so now this is the um, a very direct question. Um, you tell, you've told us about your mom experiencing racism. Have you experienced racism and how in, in, your, yeah, in your life? Um, yes, I did. Um, quite a lot at secondary school. Um, it's interesting, I've noticed it um, as I've been a father in Harrow, that at primary school, you, you've got all the races inter intersecting with one another. Uh, we lived in a very multicultural area, um, but at secondary school, things really change and, and, and children tend often, not always, um, to tribalize into different kind of ethnic, ethnic groups. Um, and so my primary experience was relatively okay. It was, it was kids not really understanding, um, you know, it was silly questions like, did, did your mother leave you out in the sun too long? Why are your hands white, but your skin brown? What's going on there? Um, but, you know, we're all silly and, you know, discovering life. So primary school wasn't so much of an issue, but secondary school really was. Um, it, it's funny, I can trace ancestry to Malaysia, Sri Lanka, India, um, Ireland, um, but everyone called me Paki, um, which is bizarre. I've, you know, never been to Pakistan, but that was their, you know, all Asians are obviously Pakistani. Um, nothing wrong with being Pakistani, but that just shows, that, you know, geography and, and racism didn't really fit well together. Um, you know, the silly stuff like they assume that my dad worked in a corner shop, um, that um, I obviously couldn't have been born here because of the colour of my skin. Um, I felt that the expectation of me from other students was that I would be stupid. Um, and actually that acted as quite an accelerant for me to want to, to um, succeed academically. Um, it was kind of part of the justification that I'm not as stupid as you think I am. And, th and that was my way that I was going to demonstrate worth, I guess. Um, and then the gospel comes along, which is wonderful and tells you, actually, you don't have to prove yourself in the eyes of your peers in order to find value. Um, but, you know, years of um, being told that you're not good enough or that you don't fit in or that you're not important um, means that you try to, you know, find another hook in which to demonstrate objectively that you are worth something. And that's where the academics kind of came in for me. Um, so it still lingers, I guess, in the back of your mind. Uh, and you try to have that gospel conversation with yourself as soon as you become aware of it, that, that your value is in the eyes of God as someone made in his image that Jesus died for. And, you know, you're resurrected with him. But it, it's always that kind of that constant uh, internal dialogue. Um, I wonder how widely you're going to share this. That would be an interesting conversation. I'm being quite open with you. The um, So there was that. I think um, it's interesting because it kind of works against and for you so in an increasingly um culturally we are recognizing the need for more diversity um and so i i i have opportunities on on national radio that i wonder if i would have if i was white and um, the fact that i'm brown and christian means that it's quite easy for radio four or radio two to use me um and and so there's, there's that, which is interesting. And I like the fact they want to increase the diversity. Um, some people are worried about tokenism. I, I think sometimes you need, tokenism is an attack word um, and, and it's often driven by jealousy. I think sometimes you've got to break the kind of glass ceiling. You've got to have someone start things for you. And so deliberately trying to diversify speaker lineups or um, you know broadcasting lineups. It's got to start somewhere. The question is what happens next, you know, and what, what role 
those voices have in the design of program rather than just being you know a pretty not even a pretty face just a brown face uh in the right place at the right time um i think i get i get a bit of attack when people say you've only got to do what you've done because you're brown so it kind of it can work for you and against you which is interesting and that's kind of a little bit of a quandary um it's, it's interesting talking to my children who are mixed race as well we have six kids three through birth and three for fostering and adoption and I, I ask them how they perceive their ethnic identity. And um, I think some of them consider themselves white because they've grown up in a majority culture and their skin isn't as brown as mine. And some of them consider themselves, um, you know, mixed race. And, you know, it depends where they are, what they want to identify as. But does that answer your question, Maria? It does, yeah. And thank you for sharing so much. Um... We, we know it's not easy sometimes to talk about yourself in such a personal way, but um, we really appreciate it. Um, the next question is some, it's about something you've already been touching on, um, and it's the way your faith and your experience of race and ethnicity has um, have like intersected. Uh, what's that relationship like in your life? Yeah, that's a good one. I, I think there are a number of different ways it has. I think being from another culture um, and having that kind of mixed cultural experience, I think it might have given me some skills in bridging um, otherwise divided groups. So I, I, I've said I'm an outsider in lots of theological, political and cultural contexts. Um, and that's okay, um, and I, it allows me sometimes to build bridges between groups that wouldn't normally work together. So I'll give you an example. So UKHK was a project we set up when we found out about the large number of uh, Hong Kong people coming to the UK. Um, so I reached out to um, friends from the missions community. Um, one, one mission agency really went for it. Uh, all the others weren't interested at all, which was interesting. Um, love to pick your brains on why that was. But anyway, uh, one really went for it. Uh, and they were a kind of white majority mission. And then I reached out to a Chinese uh, network of churches. And, and the Chinese networks of churches, to, to be honest, don't normally collaborate massively with the wider evangelical, charismatic or you know Pentecostal movements. So if you go to... Um, New Wine or Word Alive or Keswick, it's unusual to see a large contingent of Chinese people um, because they're often culturally and, and theologically conservative. Um, but for this movement, we got the white majority missions and the Chinese churches working shoulder to shoulder. And it was brilliant, you know, and, and I think some of, of you know, some, some of it is, you know, God just doing his own thing. But some of it, I think, are skills that I've learned having to navigate two different cultures all the time it means that I'm, I might be able to help bridge between different cultures. So I found that a friend of mine, a Chinese friend of mine, um, said that to me, um, which I found interesting. And I'd never thought about it before. But those difficult experiences of trying to cross cultures actually might build some skills that may be useful. So. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to other people that have had that kind of dual culture heritage, whether that's been part of their story too. Um, I think it's also helped me spot colonialism. Um, so I'll give you a couple of, for instances, um, our ch I was pastor of a church in Harrow. We were supporting, before I got there, a missionary school in Zambia. And um, we, were, we, we had a, a group come over and tell us they were raising funds for a new missionary school. And um, they, they said, you know, we must get these Zambian children into Christian education because Zambian families are full of child abusers. In fact, most Zambian men are child abusers. And I just reflected that comment back to the, the missionary to say, wait, are you seriously saying that um, because they're Zambian men, they are, you know, intrinsically more susceptible to child abuse than any other, you know, ethnic group. You know, hello, we're from the West. We have an epidemic of child abuse. Um, and, you know, you're German missionaries and you've got an English missionary here. 
um, if, if you heard that said about Germany and we wouldn't allow German missionaries to spend any time with children because there's such an outbreak of child abuse in Germany, I think you'd be offended. But it's all right for you to write off every single black Zambian man as a potential child abuser. You need to hear that that's racist. Um, I had the same situation with a Ugandan um, a white missionary in Uganda who started the largest children's village in Uganda. They won't allow black Ugandan men to sleep overnight in the Ugandan uh, children's village, but will allow white foreigners to come and volunteer for months on end. And that's because Ugandan men are, in their words, um, all potential child abusers. So, you know, that, I find that incredibly offensive. Um, and, you know, I think uh, th these are evangelical Christians. They um, read the same Bible that you and I do. And yet they can't see that that colonial um, racist mindset is currently, this is not from 50 years ago, currently shaping their missiological engagement. Um, I still see it in the way that we um, depict other cultures in our fundraising, uh, particularly missionary fundraising and even NGO fundraising. Uh, there is a reason why there was a fantastic book called Factfulness written by a Nobel Peace uh, prize winning uh, economist and he's gone around surveying what most people think of when they think of Africa or South America and it's always over exaggerated that everybody's living in abject poverty and that's because of the way that we've marketed to the west to be the saviors of uh, of you know the rest of the world there are a bottom billion of people that are in absolute poverty but there's also incredible development in Africa and South America and so this skewed thinking is so unhelpful, but we, the church, are part of perpetuating it. And it's another reason why orphanages exist, because we think that the whole system in Africa or in South America um, or Asia even are so corrupt and broken that it's impossible for people to raise their own children or to build a social work system. So there's this intrinsic double standard. Um, and I think I'm sensitized to that because partly I'm, I'm i'm from a third culture i'm not from you know britain i'm not from um malaysia or sri lanka i mean i'm in this in-between space i wonder if that's one of the reasons that i'm more sensitized to it and, and it just freaks me out that we keep keep seeing it um so that would be another way i think that collides uh, uh, one other fun way um shameless plug here um when I, when I was growing up and, and I was reading the Bible stories, um, I assumed everybody in the Bible was white. Literally everybody, because I'd, I'd seen um, Moses in a film and he was Charlton Heston and uh, every stained glass window of the saints, everybody's white, right? They're just, they're clear glass, aren't they? Jesus is clear glass and the disciples are clear glass and, you know, whoa. Um, and then as an adult, so, so as a child, I'm reading that, I'm going, well, there's no one that looks like me. There are no brown people in the Bible. I mean, maybe the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, maybe he was black, but couldn't be sure. And, and if you've ever read a good news Bible, everyone's got those white faces there as well, haven't they? So um, I, I've tried to do something about it. My wife and I have written a little, this is, this is a sample chapter, but there's a whole book around it. Um, we've written a book to try and help children re realize that most of the people in the bible are people of color um, and it's the white people that are the exception rather than the rule uh, so i'll give you a for instance have i got the, oh here we go so we, we did a we did a bit of fun we went um, and looked at some of the countries that people from the bible would be from if we were using the modern day map so um chapter one abraham the tale of the intrepid iraqi who had a lot lose oh, there's a bit of a fun thing going in there uh, the princess the tale of the extraordinary egyptian who chose to go against the flow ruth the tale of the giant-hearted jordanian who went the extra mile naaman the tale of the syrian supervillain who had a dangerous secret esther the tale of the important iranian who wished her life away uh, the centurion the tale of the italian invader who fought an unexpected battle uh, the senator the tale of the sudanese senator who made a splash Barnabas, the tale of the Cypriot sleuth who unlocked a mystery. Lydia, the tale of the groundbreaking Greek who meant business. Anesibus, the tale of the Turkish truant who risked everything. So you see what we're trying to do? Just trying to internationalize the Bible. 
this struck me. Um, I don't know if you remember those books, 10 Boys Who Changed the World, 10 Girls Who Changed the World. Have you noticed where all those boys who changed the world are from? They're all Brits or Americans who went and helped people in other countries because obviously the rest of the world had nothing to offer. Um, you know, all, the, all those poor um, believers in other countries, they were doing nothing until, you know, us Western missionaries came and sorted them all out. So I'm trying to decolonialize the way that many of us think about mission and the scriptures. And maybe we could then learn from each other and recognize there's brilliant things going on in the rest of the world. And uh, we need to be one body as the Bible calls us to. That's, um, thank you for sharing again. That's so wonderful. I think so close to some, so many of us hearts. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I love when you were reading the titles of those stories, how it felt like, um, yeah, the heart of God for the nations and hearing like modern, uh, modern names of nations, it just felt really right. Um, we normally read a verse, I forgot at the beginning in, Apoc in Revelation um, 7. And um, yeah, this is, this is what, why a place of table exists, basically to, to seek that heart of God for these hmm. topics. Um, so those are the questions we ask our guests. And thank you so much for answering them um, the way you answered. I wonder if now we could have some space for people to ask questions. Yeah. And um, what the last question we have basically is um, one that we've been asking lately and is what do we do next? That what can the people in this call do next um, to address racism, basically? Mm. Uh, but I'm, I'm gonna pause there and open the floor for questions. Um, I don't know if uh, people can unmute themselves and just ask perhaps. Um, could I jump straight in, Maria? Um, just to say thank you so much, Krish. Um, and um, when you said near the beginning that uh, you sometimes feel, I forget how you express it, but kind of maybe a bit out on a limb, um, from from our point of view like we love what you're doing what you're saying and it's actually created space for us to develop uh, things like nation, nations as a project and a, a place at the table within that um and we're expanding our refugee work and so on um and and you know so just just to say thank you and that, that you know we're 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 really grateful it does actually help to give us credibility as we're trying to pioneer a uh, smaller level here um, in Edinburgh um, but my question <laughs> so, uh, is just so one of the things that I guess we face with the place at the table is not many people coming um, and you know uh, picking a time of day is is always a challenge for anything and we've gone for these lunchtime meetings and that might be a major thing that's working against us I don't know hmm. um, but also I suppose one of the things which uh, it's hard to discern, but it's a sort of unspoken, you know, you'd imagine it probably is the case is but most people don't feel that they need to be involved in these conversations because we don't think that we have any racism in us. Mm. Um, and I just wonder if you could help us kind of, how, how could we kind of help people see the need to explore these issues? Mm. Um, really good. Duncan, and it's it's nice to connect with you. We've known each other many years. Um, I, I secretly was trying to set you up with my sister uh, once a long, <laughs> a long time ago. It didn't, didn't work out. Um, the, I think, I, I think weirdly, sadly, the church's response to, um, you know, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter has been to weaponize and militarize around this issue. So if you Google critical race theory in the church, for example, you'll find a whole bunch of people, particularly in the US, but not just in the US, who have said, this is public enemy number one to the church. And it, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's, it's such a bizarre reaction that it plays into the hands of those that criticize the church as being institutionally racist. Because we, we, we're just so afraid of it, we can't even negate. Do I agree with everything in critical race theory? Of course I don't. Um, but 
And I always think there's a way, like Paul did in Act 17, to you know read and engage with different theories, find the the points of tension, but also find the common ground. And he does both brilliantly. You know, he quotes pagan philosophers. In him we live and move and have our being. That sounds like one of the most biblical phrases in the world, but it's borrowed from a pagan philosopher. Uh, and Paul didn't go, oh, pagan philosophy, it's public enemy number one. Uh, he he actually he quotes it. You know, it's included in the word of God now because he thinks it was worth quoting um, and, and was useful. Actually, actually, you look at the Proverbs, they're doing something similar, aren't they? It's collective global wisdom that God goes, you know what? I've, I've left my fingerprints of truth uh, everywhere is it enough to get saved through no but is it is it a bit of common ground that we can kind of build upon yes so i feel the same with critical race theory do i agree with it all no are there elements that are right yes could we find the common ground and build on it that would be fantastic but instead people are going oh you know if, if, if you're if you're talking about race you're playing into some kind of neo-marxist you know takeover and, and so we're, we're avoiding the conversation again and I think that's partly due to a, an immaturity in the church and a lack of confidence in the gospel. So if you're confident in the gospel, then you're not afraid to have conversations. Uh, you know, when people are on thin ice and they don't know very much, they get louder and angrier. That, that's what the church is doing when it, when it can't handle the race conversation, it can't handle critical race theory. So I think that's one of the reasons why. And the other is timing. Like if you'd have been having this conversation a year ago, I think you'd have filled the room. Um, so I noticed it. I'd put on some rapid response uh, webinars and they were like 250 people would come. Um, I try the same topics now and you're lucky to get 25, 30. So, you know, you, you've got to, sadly, it shouldn't take, you know, whatever's going on in the culture to shape, um, you know, what the church is willing to look at. Um, but sometimes being agile and timely means that you catch the wind and you're able to be a christian voice into it so um you know some some of it's about timing I, i'd say you know jesus didn't belittle investing heavily into 12 disciples and going very deep with a few so numbers are not your main measurement the measurement is okay here are people around a table what can we do to mobilize this group to go and have impactful influence elsewhere so, you know, I'd rather work with 12 people that are really committed, that think actually there's something we can do. Um, the question is, how do you move from the conversation to action? Um, you know, our theology is only real when it's lived and acted upon. Faith is only demonstrated in action. So uh, I think that's the thing, you know, how do, what, what's the next step? What do you do with this? You know, what, what is it practically within your area of influence you can do to help the, the church to become more diverse? um theologians have a really weird thing in that there's this special box called practical theology have you ever heard of it you know this is a special super box that you put in things like evangelism and counseling um and because they're, they're the practical outworkings of our theology what the heck is the rest of theology if there's a special box called practical theology is it impractical theology that's ridiculous so I, I think we've, we've always got to be thinking, how do we move from reflection to action? What, what, what is that going to mean? Um, and you can do an awful lot with 12 people around a table. Jesus managed all sorts of things, didn't he? By the way, this is not my background. And I, I've just put this background behind so it might look like I've been in Scotland because there's a, <laughs> there's a stag head and it, it's a fake stag head behind me. So uh, this is just a projection. I'm sorry if it's inappropriate. Thanks for clarifying. Thanks, Duncan, for the question. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Go on. Someone asked me about orphanages. No, only teasing. You can ask about whatever you like. Can everyone buy this book for Christmas for their friends and relatives, particularly those <laughs> with younger children? Definitely. I'll even offer you a discount if you... <laughs> contact me i'm just gonna ask myself questions until no. I, I think uh, john has a question i can't see everyone's screen but yeah uh, okay yeah. go john tell us uh, your story where are you from um i work for edinburgh city mission uh, but currently i'm with my mum in liverpool Hello, <laughs> we're just tuning in um 
Yeah, no, I was just wondering because I've I've, I've uh, listened to quite a lot of your material on orphanages and um, um, adoption and fostering and stuff, and just wondering is there is there sort of a element of um, white saviorism and racism in adoption and fostering, um, and how yeah, how can we avoid that? I don't know. Yeah, really good. So, so let me say there's definitely elements of white saviour complex going on in orphanages. And then let's see if it also tracks back into other areas too. So, uh, okay, man, I'll, I'll try not to be controversial. So, so um, be controversial. <laughs> the, the orphanages, like when you think of orphanages and the Christian faith, who do you think of? Um, I'll give you a clue, Bristol. Uh, he didn't make yogurt, but you think he might have done. Does the name George Muller mean anything to you? So George Muller had an orphanage with 3,000 people in it, 3,000 children in it in Bristol uh, in the 19th century. And you go, okay, that's interesting. What has happened that there are 3,000 children that have lost their mums and dads, aunties and uncles and grandparents in some catastrophe um, that's wiped them all out? The answer is there was no catastrophe. The reason why there were 3,000 children in an orphanage in Bristol is poverty. So children were poor, um, they were hungry, they weren't getting an education, and they weren't being clothed. And so George Muller, and I, I, I you know, I find him incredibly inspiring. Um, and obviously, he inspired Hudson Taylor, that, and, and that inspired the, the, you know, things like China Inland Mission and the Cambridge Seven, you know, the, the origin story of the modern mission movement. Okay, so he is definitely a hero. He's looked at something called workhouses. And he said, I think I can do better than a workhouse. Let's create an institution that really cares for children and doesn't exploit them. But he was, a, a, he was kind of a person of his time. And he, he went from workhouses to orphanage, which is better. But actually, all of those children are likely to have had mums and dads, aunts and uncles, grandparents that could have cared for them. So the driver into the orphanage was poverty. But the other driver into the orphanage was compassion. They wanted to help them, but I think they used a mechanism that actually deconnected these children from their families. The plus side for the church was that they could evangelize them. So, you know, again, we're all con moment, you know, constrained with our context. You know, we're all trying to read the Bible and do the best we can. We all make mistakes. But that, that's the best way I can read it, driven by compassion and a desire to evangelize. We took 3,000 children out of their family units, and then that model got exported to the rest of the world under the faith movement. And so what happened was, I think there was a class element to it. I think we thought middle class people would be better at looking after children than their working class or, or poorer families. And that mindset got taken to the rest of the world. We thought we could do a better job as white people and educated people and middle class people than local indigenous people. You can specifically see that happening in countries like Australia, Canada and New Zealand, where the church in collaboration with the government deliberately removed children from indigenous families and tried to um, save the child and kill the Indian. That's how it was described in North America. Um, this has come into the news recently in Canada where they found the bodies of 250 plus children in the vicinity of an institutional school that was run with the government and the church. That's why there's this huge backlash about the church's colonial history in Canada. Um, and it's because we thought we could do a better job of raising these children in an institution with Christian values than their families could. So you can see how class and race have led to unbelievably catastrophic consequences for family life. And, and in Canada, we're reaping that down, you know, three generations. So in Canada, there's about 30,000 children in the care system awaiting adoption. The vast majority of those children from indigenous families whose family life was destroyed when those children were taken out of, in, out of their families into the institutions. And then they age out of those institutions and they've got no understanding of family, no experience of family. And so there's a huge epidemic of drugs and um, alcohol abuse, and then their children get taken into foster care. So complete mess. Mm -hmm. So what I would say, and you know, it's still possible. Um, sorry, one other bit about white, white savior complex. So a lot of children in orphanages around the world 
white Westerners go to those countries where the orphanages are and try to adopt children out of the orphanages. Now, hold on, why are you adopting children in orphanages that actually have living parents? Do you remember Madonna adopted a child? Uh, I think it was from Malawi. And there's videos of her meeting the child's dad. This child is not an orphan, does not need adoption. He needs to be reunited with birth family um, under the right circumstances. So what ends up happening, and again, if, if you've done this, it, it's totally okay. And, you know, how can we support you? But if someone's coming to me saying, should I go to China, Africa, South America and adopt children out of orphanages? My bottom line is, no, you shouldn't. Okay, number one, these children have living families, so let's support them to go back. Um, number two, um, you know, if they're older children, they have culture and history in that culture, and bringing them to a third culture is going to be really challenging and problematic. Number three, it's incredibly expensive because you've got to pay all the legal bills. Um, and number four, in your own country, there are children that genuinely need adoption because they've been in the care system, not because of poverty, not because of racism, hopefully, we can talk about that if you want to, uh, but because of neglect or abuse, and they cannot live with their birth family. We've explored their wider kinship care uh, framework of aunties and uncles and grandparents, and there's no one available for them. That's why they're in the care system. And these children genuinely need families. In America, there are 120,000 children waiting for adoption, and yet Americans still travel halfway across the world to adopt children that don't need adopting, they need reuniting with families. So, so John, you're right, there is a history of white savior complex and, and the church is implicated in it. And we've all got things wrong. I'm sure I've done enough things wrong in my life, but it doesn't mean we should allow it to continue. And we've got to find a way to redress this and help people re-engage children back with their families. And, and there is this global movement that the church is now um, helping to lead on in many circles where we're supporting indigenous people to receive their children back and if the children can't go back, then finding local fostering and adoption solutions. So that's my next call, actually. We're talking about this with six countries in Latin America um, where there is this movement afoot and we're trying to help those countries in, in a non-colonial way to get the resources they need to be able to rebuild their social care systems. Man, it, that might have been really unhelpfully brief and I'm sorry if I was flippant. And feel free to push back and ask me a question and ask me to correct something. Thank you. I wonder if we could um, share perhaps your email or um, like some way if people have more questions, because I'm aware this is very brief and maybe people might have some follow up um, questions they may want to ask. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I'll put it in chat for people. Great, great. Um, and now I wonder if it, to, uh, or Andy, you want to ask a question? I saw you un unmuting yourself. Hey, if I may. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Chris, um, I suppose I'm, we've, we've all got blind spots and, you know, you helpfully were um, giving us the story of how you, I suppose you helped you help the missionary explore the blind spot. Um, what? How do, by the nature of blind spots, or blind them? So, are there other kind of principles or ways of of us overcoming these these blind spots in ourselves and for the church? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Andy. Uh, um, in, in literary theory, they they describe increasing your hermeneutical circle, which is a really posh way of saying get friends from different places. Um, there, there's something powerful about breaking out of our tribes. Our tribes create blind spots. Um, and, and that can happen theologically, where we end up in one tribe and we don't engage with people outside of those tribes. Um, you know, I, I grew up in one tribe uh, in my early, you know, teens and 20s, uh, which really emphasized the intellect. You know, um, in fact, we used to in introduce speakers by telling us, telling them how big their brains were. Hey, you've got to listen to this speaker. Their brain is the size of a planet. And you go, okay, that's interesting. What about their heart? You know, um, you know to, to what extent are they demonstrating the compassion and grace of Jesus? It, it's interesting. That tribe makes you sign a doctrinal statement before you speak at any of their events, but they never ask you about your lifestyle. 
Um, so, you know, because there's that, the tribe says the head is all that matters. Yeah. So I think theologically, there's something beautiful about deliberately spending time with people, studying the scriptures, praying, working alongside people that are different from you. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to agree. But again, if we're genuinely believers, there is more that unites us than separates us. So that, that's important. Um, some people recognize they need to do that with their media intake. So back in the day, some pastors used to subscribe to the newspaper that they wanted to read because it aligned with them politically. But they also used to deliberately subscribe to a newspaper that was different to them because they wanted to make sure that their church was able to communicate the gospel in a way that made sense to different tribes. With social media, they talk about the echo chamber. So yeah. if we're not careful, our theological tribes can put us in this echo chamber again. Um, so, so, you know, have friends, make, make connections outside of your denominational and tribal boundaries. But that also needs to happen at a global level. We are the most connected we've ever been on the planet, and yet we're the most polarised that we've been because we're not making use of those global contexts. So, you know, nowadays, when it comes to holding a prayer meeting, you don't need to just pray for a country. You can pray with a country. And you don't even need to pray with the missionaries that you've sent to that country because they're going to give you a, a, a particular view. You could be praying with you know, local leaders from that country. Um, and, and that's a, a great way that we can kind of combine together. Um, and again, maybe we should rethink the kind of short-term missions idea where you send a bunch of teenagers to build a wall in a country when you spent like £30,000 for them to go build a wall that a local person could have built. And, you know, it would have been a better wall and only cost you 50 quid. Um, and instead, talk about mutual exchange programs. Um, where you learn from one another. Let, let's build those bridges. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to missionary design, so you, you never want to be designing an intervention that does things to people. You want to be including the people that you're trying to serve in the design of the program. Um, and that would mean including care experienced people in designing the program that's going to serve them. I don't think most children would design an orphanage as a great way of helping them uh, to flourish. Every child I've ever met is longing for a family. So designing things with people um, will help you. We have a little phrase that I use that someone shared with me, nothing about us without us. That means including those. So if, if you're working with the homeless, to what extent do the homeless shape the way that you are designing a program? They're not just a receiver at the end of of the process that you have designed in a locked room you've done it in conversation with the people you're trying to serve that that's because we believe in the intrinsic dignity of all that they we're serving with they are made in the image of god they've got something to say they've got a voice they've got a perspective so you know, there, there are simple development um, design empowerment techniques that we can utilize that actually reflect christian values better than some of our own practices but that's a very short answer to a longer question andy Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and everyone who has asked questions. I saw Sabina, you also asked a question in the chat uh, about some resources. Um, so, yeah, perhaps, I don't know, Chris, if you can put a link on the chat or something. I'm just aware it's two o'clock yeah. and this is our, this is us <laughs> running out of time. So, I thank you again on behalf of everyone here, but especially on behalf of the Edinburgh City Mission team. And also thank you to everyone who um, came along and um, just listened and has been listening and learning. Um, just a couple of invitations. Next year we have our conference in February or March. Um, please just um, keep your an eye on our social media and the newsletter for a date and a venue. Um, Andy will be speaking at our conference, Andy Longway, who introduced himself at the start of the conversation, and he will be also interviewed at a place at the table that we do live at the conference in person, um, God willing. And uh, you're all invited to that. Um, thank you again. Just also on a personal note, I am not going to be here anymore. I'm moving back to Colombia, where I'm from. So if you want to expand, you know, put in practice what Chris just said and invite me to prayer things uh, from across the ocean. I'll be very happy to uh, stay in touch with everyone here. And um, it's been a pleasure to 
listen to these people and um, share questions with you all. And Chris, I don't know if you want to say something as a um, goodbye, and that would be us. Brilliant. Um, resources, it's going to sound self-serving again, but if, if you follow me on Twitter, every time I find anything useful, I try and share it there. So that is my um, scrapbook, notebook of what's going on in the world. So um, feel free uh, to follow along there. If you don't use Twitter, I, I sometimes use Instagram and Facebook if they're useful too. Um, but I, I just want to thank you for inviting me. It's been lovely to have the conversation. Uh, it's been a long day already, so I'm sorry if I was a bit angular. I, um, I'm going to ha hang out with a friend of mine from uh, Sri Lanka on Monday. Uh, Vino from Achandra is uh, coming through, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to meeting him. But sometimes he's a bit edgy, so maybe some of that edginess has come off today. Um, but yes, I'm grateful for what you're doing. I, we've been working with you um, in Afghan Welcome to support Afghan refugees in Edinburgh, and it's been fabulous to see what you're doing. So uh, thanks for being a partner with us, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Thank you again, and thanks everybody. Have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>